Welcome everyone. You're listening to Sanctuary's Coffee and Conversation Show. My name is Myrna Haskell. I'm executive editor of Sanctuary Magazine. This is an online magazine for women that empowers and inspires with a focus on the arts, humanitarian pursuits, health and wellness, inspirational travel, culture, and community. You can find us at sanctuary-magazine.com. This morning, my guest is Dr. Emily Bobson. She is a chiropractor serving clients in the Hudson Valley region of New York, which is very beautiful right now, by the way, with all of the fall foliage. Yeah. She specializes in family chiropractic, pregnancy and pediatrics, and she is also a holistic health expert. So our topic today is perfect because we're going to be talking about managing overwhelm. Good morning, Emily. Thanks so much for joining me today. Good morning, Myrna. Always so much fun to do this with you. I'm excited. I am too. And I know that our regular listeners and readers recognize you. Emily is also a gold sponsor of Sanctuary. She's a big support of us and she's been on a few coffee and conversations with us before. So you all know that she is very well versed, versed in lots of different topics concerning everyday health. But let's dig in with this. You know, um, Emily, I'm sure from reading the magazine, you know, we've touched upon upon this topic before, but so many of our readers struggle with this day in and day out, and we're all still trying to figure it out. And one of the things that I know a lot of us had a, have a hard time with is that saying no piece, like understanding when you've stretched yourself too thin and that it's okay to say no. And I know for, for myself personally, there have been a couple of times in my life when I've said yes to way too many things, and then I'm pulling my hair out and not able to be my best self in everything I'm doing. Yes. So um, I just want to hear from you, you know, when should we say no? When is it okay to say no? Should we let our, ourselves feel okay about saying no? So let's just dig into that a little bit. Yeah, that's a big, a big topic in itself. You think it's simple, but it's not. And saying no really comes from a space within you that is resourced. So you know the difference when something's coming into your realm of what, you know, you want to do everything and you have to know who are you and what type of person you are and also understanding that in a way that gives you a reflection back onto yourself to know what type of scenarios come towards you that will serve you and what type of scenarios will come towards you that won't. But you only will know that by knowing yourself better. And unfortunately, what I find in my own experience is that I will say yes to everything because if I say no, it means that I'm not doing enough or that I'm failing something. I think so, a lot of us feel that way, Emily. That's you are a big not one. Alone. Yes. And everything that we talk about, Myrna, and anything that I talk about in my office isn't coming from a lack of experience and trying to figure it out myself. So when you say, let's do a talk on overwhelm, my first thought is, how could I do this talk? I am struggling so much with dealing with overwhelm myself because I'm a people pleaser. I like to fix things and I also like to say yes to everything because I want to seem like I'm, I'm capable of doing everything I'm being asked from so or asked for. So I really looked into this as a way to like, I was glad you asked me to do this because I really looked into this as a way for me to reflect on my own overwhelm, how I manage it you know, what makes sense, what I know I should do, what I actually do, and the reality of what we're all dealing with, not from a place of lecturing people on what's right or wrong or how to do something, but from experience and going, you know, let's really reset and look, pan back and think, how do we even get to a place of being able to say no without feeling the stress of saying no? Oh, and you know what, Emily, I love that. And I love your presentation of it. And I think that's why you're able to help people so much because it does come from a place of authenticity and working on things on your own. And, you know, some of those things you said about 
feeling like you're not doing enough or wanting to please everybody, being a people pleaser or wanting to care for everyone else first. I think this is sort of like the female condition these days, you know? I think that's why so many of us struggle with it. So I want, I had talked to you a little bit about this before we came on the show and you talked about prioritizing things that drive towards your purpose. Yes. So I think maybe that goes hand in hand with the saying no business, knowing what's part of where your mission is and your purpose yes. will help you actually with those things you need to yes. say no and yes to, right? So let's talk a little bit, of, I guess, about prioritization. Yes. yes. So um, first I want to talk real, and that's exactly where we want to go for sure. But the thing is too, I think you know your purpose, right? We know what we want to do because I know I'm really clear on my purpose. But I also don't know what it feels like when I'm in overwhelm because I'm so in a part of my brain that's in a fight or flight place. So I have to get this done. I cannot listen to reason. Nobody can tell me how to do it. I'm totally on my own. I'm resentful. I'm over, you know, there's too much information coming at me. I don't know how to feel. So the signs of knowing when you're overburdened is the first thing because then you can actually own it, recognize it, and do something about it. Okay. And then you can start to sit down with a clear head going, all right, this is overwhelm. And I think we mask a lot of it and go through our days like in this automatic gerbil wheel kind of mentality. And then I just personally, I just go, I'm overwhelmed. I'm just overwhelmed. I'm just overwhelmed. You know, and it like never goes anywhere. It just becomes this piled on, piled on stuff. So first things first, can you recognize when you're overwhelmed? And so the signs of knowing you're overwhelmed the first one for me is I start to get resentful of the people that I'm closest with, that I'm safest with. So, of course, who's that going to be? My partner, first, my children, second. And that is the last thing I want because what I'm doing in this world is to make it better for the people I love the most. And then it just trickles out to everyone else. So I'm actually creating strife and stress in my house, which isn't going to support me. And it just does the snowball thing where nobody, yes. right. So now you're more stressed because now, now you're, you're more stressed your family, because now right? you're, yeah, you're fighting, you're trying to, right. So it's resentment. Uh, it's unable to admit that you have your own needs. So not being a martyr, right. I have right. my own needs. unwilling to be vulnerable. So that looks like I got this. I don't need any help. I can say yes to everything and I start tumbleweeding into yeses and now I'm getting more resentful and then I become martyr, a martyr, like I do everything, nobody does anything. I start that, like all that strife starts to come up around me and so I need to admit, okay, I need support and if that's hard to say for you, you're in overwhelm. Okay. Oh, that's an excellent way of putting it. I think everybody can understand that now. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so, I think it probably manifests a little different depending on people's lifestyles and what their family situation that's is. Why I gave, yeah, different but I'm hearing resentment. I'm hearing you're flustered. I'm hearing, you know, you're not feeling good about your day, your entire day, really. Exactly. Um, and everything feels like yeah. hurting. So if, if, if you understand that then, that you are in the state of overwhelm, how do we know then how to keep ourselves on track, you know, okay. keep ourselves toward that purpose, that mission yeah. in life, that mission yeah. maybe with our business in some circumstances? Right. <clears throat> so, so what I'm noticing and what seems to help me the most is a daily practice that has no excuses and is limited to five minutes at first, maybe. 
Because everybody can take five minutes, right? <laughs> five minutes. Ladies, if we can't, and gentlemen, if we can't take five minutes, we're in overwhelm. <laughs> Exactly. And a lot of, exactly, because a lot, because you'll start, you're in a fight or flight brain, right? And when you're in that fight or flight part of your brain, you're now making decisions that go towards life. You're making decisions that shut things down. So the big part of you that um, can create and make things better, or, you know, like you can evolve and you can create symphonies or write, write poems or have a, uh, heart filled space with your family that's shut down completely so what do we need to do to starting our day out or even ending our day with five minutes of gratitude okay because that's going to reset go into your heart space and there you can go into the other part of your nervous system which i'm an expert at in how do we go to the place where we can make decisions that are for the highest good and the most loving for us and our family and our world. And then that takes the resentment away at the same time. It absolutely. You're in a place of gratitude instead of a it place of resenting it. Yes. everyone and everything it around you. Because, right. because we're going to resent or be in a defense posture, mental posture, not just physical, when you start going into that fight or flight and you're going to protect yourself so that nobody can ask you to do anything more. Okay. So you're going to Because you out. keep saying yes and not understanding when it is that you have to say no and keep your focus and, and, you, and right. keep your sanity, really. And you make the decision in a way for yourself, but in a way that doesn't serve you or anyone else. So you're like opposing yourself at every turn because now you have no support, you've isolated yourself, and you're still saying yes, but you're, but you're nodding no. And how do your kids and your husband or your mate or the people that love you, how do they deal with that? So really what, what, create, what happens is you're, you, know, um, you, you, create, uh, you create a lot of, I'm gonna read what I wrote down here, I wrote, um, Noticing that you're a constant caregiver is you're stuck in the role. You always live in crisis mode and it's at the expense of inner peace and personal growth. The goal is to turn within, face your own needs so that you can stop fixing others, but become a model to the world of empowerment and a true source of healing that starts with you first. Oh, I love that. Yes. And then also to understand when you get to that place, you're able to help others better anyway, because you are modeling this. You're not stressing out your family. Yes. You're not, you know, snapping at your coworkers or right. your employees, right? And I have a good example of that, which I just recently learned because I'm becoming aware because of you asking me to do overwhelm. And now I'm looking at myself and wondering how to apply this, not only for someone else, but my own self in my own life. And I have a teenage daughter. We have six kids between us me and my partner she's the last one in the house for all intents and purposes things should be easier but they're more stressful right one kid left she is amazing an amazing child she is extremely you know considerate loving and kind but i'm running around screaming i'm overwhelmed i can't take any more on so like even a little conversation becomes this strife-filled, stressful event that nobody feels heard or loved. Okay, and I, I was like, there. why are we doing this over and over again? Like, I don't understand what my partner's asking from me. I don't understand what she's asking from me. I can't do one more thing. And here's this sweet teenager. I mean, there, no teenagers are really sweet, but, you know, good <laughs> You know, and she knows I that. I wrote the book on that. You <laughs> and I deserve everything I'm getting right now. But, you know, but she really works hard and she's really good at communication. She's the baby. So she got a lot of attention and she's clear about what she needs. And she's also really like, this is what I need. And I'm like, well, this is what I need. And you can't tell me what to do. And we're getting into this constant 
you know, op opposition and we're polarizing constantly and now we're all kind of like fighting and I'm like, wait a second. I said, let me ask you a question, Gloria. Where did you learn how to deal with your stress? And she looks at me and she goes, you. And I said, I'm sorry. I'm not dealing with my stress. Yeah. Well. yeah. And guess what? I'm getting it back in spades with how you're dealing with your stress because now it's coming back at me, not only from myself, but now, you know, mirrored back at me. So I apologize to her. I apologize to my spouse or my mate. And I said, I'm sorry. I've been doing a lot of um, fighting and I've been, you know, resentful. I've been unable to admit that I need help. I've been acting like a tyrant. I've been short with everyone and I'm expecting to get support from you. And that's not fair. And basically no one's getting support and we're turning against each other because I'm not modeling how to re resource myself. And so of course, uh, my daughter doesn't know how to resource herself and my mate doesn't feel supported or loved or heard. And it's just one big cluster. Yeah. So who's well, gonna I can tell you, Emily, you are not alone. I have been there and I'm sure everybody has been there, right? Um, but I'm hearing you. I'm hearing that understanding yourself, knowing where your pitfalls are, asking for help, all of those things, um, to bring everything down so that you can focus on yourself, those who, who you love. You can say no without feeling guilty and all of that. Right. But I'm wondering if um, you might be able to, because I know, I, I know that you, it's not you might be able to, I know you will be able to because yeah. I've spoken to you about some of this, but there's that point where you were talking about fight or flight and all of that. Yes. There's that point where maybe you're rational, you know what you're supposed to be doing. You've right. got all of your tools in your toolbox, but it's a runaway day. You yeah. Know, it's just one of those things where you're spiraling out. Maybe you have anxiety and you're having anxiety For attack, sure. or whatever that may be. You, you've lost control of it. Yep. Do you have any other quick tips for our audience that says yeah. how to bring that kind of thing down to get your headspace back? Yes. I will always divert, avert, divert, what's the right word? Divert, <laughs> divert I think. Divert. <laughs> I will always go back to breath. And now. I've been doing it since I've met you. Yeah, I never did this, folks, and this is the God's honest truth, before I met Dr. Emily. I started doing this, and I'm going to let her talk about it when well, I met you, her, and it's my go-to now. So go what, ahead, Emily. So I want to know from you, what did you notice? Do you think that that's the way for you to be able to reset quickly? I think you, it brings my heart rate down. It helps to refocus me. I stop thinking about everything else because I think about what I'm doing with the breathing, right? Yeah. So it kind of like all that stuff that's coming in 100,000 miles a minute, you kind of push that aside because you're focusing on the counting and the breathing and your chest right. going up and down and all of that. So it's, it's, it's physiological too, right? Exactly. Your heart that's rate is slowing down and you're thinking about yeah. how you're breathing and all of yeah. that. It works for me. I Good. know people have other things, but the breathing does work for me. It works for everyone. It's just knowing why you're doing it and what would give you the fastest way to get where you need to go as far as the ease that you want to get back into your system. So one of the things that I've learned over time about breath, because I love it and I utilize it, and I know it saved my life on many counts, is that... There are receptors, physiological receptors in your lungs that will note, tell your body, we're going to have to run or we can sit and relax and we're safe. A lot of people shallow breathe up in the top of their chest. So you'll see their shoulders rising. They'll take a deep breath. I'm taking breaths, but it's not working. You know, and so their shoulders are rising. And I do a lot of breath observation in the office when people come in see me and I know where people are breathing and if breath is getting where it needs to in order to put ease into the system. So it's the primary way we know what we need to do next. So if you're breathing up in the top of your chest, 
then you're not hitting the right receptors to put you into an e a state of ease. So it's very important to, when you're doing the breath, take it down through your nose, the back of your throat, and then imagine, make it up at first, that you are expanding it down into the lower part of your diaphragm and open the belly. So I call this Buddha breath, and you're gonna get a Buddha belly. And so I know at first, for me as a woman, We've been trained to keep our bellies in right. because it's embarrassing to see a big, you know, belly popping out. So I had to really be like, it's okay. I'm in my a little private closet, wherever you need to go into the bathroom, hold your belly, love your belly, you know, and allow that breath to come down below the diaphragm and do that for 10 breaths, so try 10, you know, try right. five, whatever it is. And at first you're not gonna feel comfortable. It's gonna feel weird. And you're also gonna fight or flight that as well because you're in that, I can't, I don't have time for this. I, da, 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 I can't do it right. I don't. So just allow to be an observer of all the stress that's gonna start to come up. It's kind of like a detox and push that belly out take that sacred pause for yourself and watch what happens when you have to make the next de next decision right that needs to be made it's going to be made out of like peace and ease and grace instead of this decision you're going to make out of fear fight or flight and it'll start to set the tone for what happens next in your family you know in your job in your life in your relationships the the, the challenge is always being able to wrangle yourself out of that fight or flight brain. And that always starts with a very easy breath, one, and then go to the next. And then, you know, to, so just say, I only and have you to- You only do need like three minutes or five minutes. Change you the physiology. that's the thing for me, Emily, because I know there are some people who are really, um, you know, good at sort of meditation, other types of meditation, taking their minds to another place, you know, closing their eyes and doing that. I find that this is easier to learn because for me, if I'm in that fight, flight, you know, anxiety ridden state, there's no way I'm bringing my mind to a beach, you know, no. having to do the breath, which I guess yeah. is a lot of people who meditate anyway, they probably start with breath work, right? Maybe. Yeah. But, I, I but that's know. all you need in a yeah. lot of circumstances. Yeah. You don't have to go into deep meditation. No, you don't. Minutes. And I'm one that like, I resent, I resist meditation. Like it's the plague. Like there's something wrong with meditation. I know that meditation would probably change my life but I first need to get into the place in my brain where I will choose things that are good for me over the emergency response that I've been doing since I've probably been born, you know, that I am in emergency mode. This is how my brain is. So now we have to reroute and slowly love ourselves into a new way of doing things without the adrenal push that we're all so used to getting things done and people get scared because they think or worry that if I get myself into a relaxed state I'm not going to be able to do all the things I need to do because we're used to that cortisol push of stress to push us through that's a that's a habit that's a that's a pathway in our brain that now we're addicted to almost yeah so yeah. really we think it, that's the only way Exactly. Yeah, I I so agree. we have a pathway in our brain. This is how we do it. So now the work is creating a new pathway, which is not easy, very, very uncomfortable, and also a new way of doing things. But as you just, I, uh, I don't know if you've read the book Atomic Habits. No. I recommend this book for everyone because basically he says, just do something for one or two minutes maybe he says three you can do anything for three minutes that's right once you start that daily three minute practice it will grow into something that you're choosing to do and you'll start the new pathway and the new brain reorientation of changing and doing a new habit so i would say let's keep it really simple three minutes you can do anything yeah, that's right. Right. You and can do it's it. not overwhelming. And it's not overwhelming. <laughs> 
Exactly. Well, Emily, I'm the little a little birdie told me that you have started a nonprofit. And yeah. so I want to take the last couple of minutes to talk about that. And I also want to remind readers that some of you sent in some questions about the challenges of starting a nonprofit. So I am talking to the expert who's going to give you some advice, and that will appear in our Ask an Expert section in December. But we want to hear a little bit about the nonprofit, what the mission is, and what your plans are, Emily. That would be great. This is something that's really, really close to my heart. I've been wanting to do this since I started um, thinking even about being a chiropractor. And one of the things that I found, there were really big holes in alternative complementary care was the opportunity to get more than one experience or one adjustment or one acupuncture session or one massage session because the reality is anything we do takes repetition to heal. And so one of the breakdowns that I think we have in, in any kind of preventative care is the understanding that one thing, one time, one exercise routine is good. You started, but it doesn't, you may get that, you know, relief or something, but nothing stays corrected unless you do a repetition. So people are having trouble, especially now with the financial burdens that they're under and the people that need it the most, like single moms and people who are in uh, underprivileged situations, Christ, need crisis care, but they don't have access to some regular preventive care and then how to resource themselves, how to get them out of the fight or flight brain, it's not gonna be one visit. So how do we support these people, which is most of the population, to be able to afford a care plan that will help them get further in life and better in life. But you know, you're saying you need these many visits and they're like, where's that money coming from? My insurance policy for, for medical care is like 1500 a month for my whole family. I know this would make my life better, but I won't be able to access right. it. Yeah. So I have a fire lit under my butt around, especially being a single mom and having breast cancer, I was able to access a lot of stuff because I had a community of healers around me who gave it to me, but who has that? Right, right. So, I would but think how important was that to you that you it did was and that's life, what you're hoping for it was life then. saving. It was life saving yes. because there was nowhere in my life where I could resource myself and help myself with stress so that I could heal because you can't be in a stress brain and a heal brain at the same time. So thank God I had that community, right, that supported me. And I all I could think of when I was on the table, really, which is kind of crazy is I feel so lucky to be able to access this care, but also so guilty because what about the, uh, and I'm gonna cry, what about the single mom who has no one and she has breast cancer and three children and has no one right. to support her and to get anything beyond the basics. No one's touching her, no one's giving her you know, anything to resource yourself. And I felt really lucky and really guilty at the same time. And so that's what drove me to say, I have to do something to be able to support people who should, everyone should be able to access self-care, you know, alternative care, complementary care, whatever you want to call it. Everyone should be able to access this. It shouldn't just be allopathic care. Yes. And that's, I, that's a wonderful inspirational story, um, the backstory behind this. And it's called Infinite Equitable Healing Foundation. Is that yes. what, right? And yes. could you just say, do you have a website up yet for the right nonprofit? Now, we're, we're, at, we're almost at the end of getting the website made. So a couple more weeks, it'll be up. Okay. It, it's a, so it's a sanctuary picture. listeners and readers, we will have something in the magazine about that. So you can get access to information about this new nonprofit. So no worries there. Right. Um, I think it's, it's a wonderful um, organization you're starting. Um, Emily, I think, you know, it's breast cancer awareness month. 
I so know we have some folks right out there now, um, right. so people who know them maybe. Right. We need these types of resources since it's I not also want to mention, I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, no, but I, it's important that I mention that um, a lot of these nonprofits will raise money, but it's going to go towards like research and stuff and like things that the individual can't directly access, although it's good for the overall um, the overall uh, nonprofit to be able to continue to offer op different options for, you know, advancing research in breast cancer and all of that, and also other things. And again, we're not just isolated to breast cancer. It's anyone right. who needs access to alternative or complementary care, not in lieu of medical care, because that's different. We're talking right. emergency care versus preventative uh, supportive care, right? Yes. So um, that's a different thing, right? But also there's there's not a lot available for people who are sick or don't want to get sick, who can't afford to access this care for prevention, right? Um, and it's really important that they know that there's stuff available out there for them. You do have to look but just because let's say you call like breast cancer society of, you know, whatever that, and they, I did go through this and they don't have individual um, uh, care for people, but they're doing research or spending money on research. Right. This is this. And then there's another one called breast care options that I still think is out there. I think it is that they provide um, support for women who have breast cancer and they do give them like, I think it's seven visits to any provider that they want to go to. So there's scholarships like that available. We're going to be doing scholarships. We're also going to provide links in to all these different things that are available for people to access. Perfect. 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 Well, thank you so much for joining me today. I mean, it's just wonderful. You speak from the heart. You talk about your own pitfalls. We're all human and we're all going through this, but we really and truly appreciate your advice, Emily. Thank you so Thank much you. for joining me today. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. I'll close as I always do by wishing all of our listeners and our readers good health, happiness, and continued inspiration. Thank you so much for joining us.